Hey all, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series. And in this one, I'm going over my round three game from the Southwest class um, that took place in February 2019. Uh, my opponent in this one is international master Guillermo Vasquez, um, a strong player from some part of South America. Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head, but actually goes to one of the chess schools in the United States and Texas. I call that the I call this crop of schools like UTD and Webster and these schools that give full-ride chess scholarships um, to international players, uh, the chess universities. And so um, I know this guy was one of them. And uh, there are actually quite a few in the country right now, which is great for American chess because it means that a lot of uh, players get the opportunity to play a stronger crop of players. It's a bigger pool of talent. Um, so in any case, um, this guy was white. I know he's actually a pretty good player, uh, pretty reliable, solid uh, player. And he also happens to be very tall. I know this doesn't you know, come into play very often, uh, but he's easily the tallest chess player I've ever played. Um, he, I, I, he's towering. And, I, and I'm actually kind of tall. I'm about six feet. Um, I am six feet. And uh, this guy, I think he must be like six eight, six nine, maybe six ten. I don't know. But he's a tall dude. So that's the first thing you notice. Um, but in any case, let me get into the game. So he played e4. I played e6. Uh, if you notice, the French has served me fairly well, so I decided to try it out again. d4, d5, and knight d2. And this was actually the first moment where I was like, uh-oh, did he see my first round game? Because in the first round of this tournament against FM Doug Eckert, I played the French. And there aren't really a lot of live boards in this tournament, so I didn't know. Um, well, the board I played on was certainly not live in uh, in the in the first round. Um, and in fact, in American tournaments, you actually have to bring your pieces and clock. Believe that, crazy. You have to bring your pieces and clock to uh, to tournaments a lot of the time. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it definitely wasn't a live board, but at the same time, I didn't know if this guy Guillermo Vasquez had walked around, you know, taken a look at some games and happened to see mine, then mentally registered that, and then, uh, you know, thought about, uh, you know, challenging me uh, based on what he'd seen in the first round. Um, I know that takes a little bit of, you know, mental gymnastics, but it happens quite a bit, and I can honestly say uh, I've done that to other people because. Um, it's quite a normal thing um, when you're playing in these long, uh, long time controls where you get up, you know, you stretch your legs, you walk around when it's not your turn, and uh, you look at other games. That's what you do. Um, in fact, uh, it's actually um, can be the downfall of many uh, chess players that they find the other games going on to be more interesting than their own, and they focus on those games. Um, so I was, you know, I've always been, uh, one of those people that does like to look at other games. Um, I've tamped it down in recent years, but man, I've taken a stroll all over the top boards seeing, okay, this opening played, this opening is played not just to see what opponents, uh, are potentially playing, but just to see in general where the meta game of chess is. Um, it's kind of interesting to see like, oh, there are a lot of Sicilians going on. Okay. Good to know. Or, oh, this is, there's a lot of, um, Kings Indians going on. This is uh, an opening that's in fashion. So you really can get a sense of that just by walking around the room. Anyways, uh, I was kind of curious to see where my opponent was going to go from here. So I decided to go in, into the line a bit further and I went c5, which is what I played in round one. E takes d5, queen takes d5. Again, this also happened in round one. Knight gf3, c takes d4. Bishop c4, queen d7, castles, knight c6, knight b3, and a6. And I'd played all of these moves in my first round game. So I was just curious here, what is the idea? What was he going to present? Um, in the in round one, Doug played a4, um, stopping this b5 move. Um, in this game, my opponent played knight takes d4, which is actually a move I thought I actually expected in round one, so I thought I was more familiar with this one. And the idea I had here was that if her knight takes d4, knight takes d4 to actually go queen c7. 
Very strange looking move, I admit. Um, again, you seem to be breaking the, the rules of chess in a way, um, the unwritten rules, moving the queen too many times. Note that it, it started on d8, then it went to d5, then it went back to d7, and now it went to d c7. So that's four moves with the queen, or three moves with the queen in the span of, you know, maybe like 10. Um, and so why is that? Well, the reason for that here is to get a tempo on the bishop. And then as another idea is to potentially get this battery on the h2 pawn. So I thought this was a reasonable way to play. Bishop d3 was played. Um, this is uh, uh, one of a few moves. I mean, white can also go queen e2. Uh, white can even drop the bishop back to b3. Um, white can even go pawn b3, I believe. So all these are moves. Um, but uh, bishop d3 was uh, Guillermo's. Um, so after bishop d3, I went for bishop d6 um, because, again, that was kind of the thought process I had is, okay, get this pressure against the h2 pawn, and then white has to kind of deal with that. I get a tempo on it, um, and then maybe I can develop my knight to f6 or to e7, depending on the circumstance, and just get a reasonable position. Boy, oh boy, was I surprised when in this position white did not defend the h2 pawn at all but instead went for rook e1. And here I was like, oh man, I have walked into some nasty, nasty prep. Because it was like, wait, white doesn't have to defend the h2 pawn? Why not? What's the, what's the, what's the idea here? So the first thing I did recognize was and appreciate was that because the rook is on the e-file now, white is kind of threatening knight f5. So let's say I make a normal developing move like knight f6, trying to get closer to castling. Um, white just has knight f5. And the issue is not only is g7 hit, um, but also, again, this d6. Ooh, I'm so bad at arrows. But this d6 bishop is hit. And these this d6 bishop is a huge asset. Um, uh, just as an example, let's say I castle. It, this actually just loses on the spot to knight takes d6, queen takes d6, and it's bad enough I've lost the two bishops, but now I also lose my queen with bishop takes h7 check, and you can see this queen on d6 is undefended. So already knight f5 is, presents itself as a threat, so so uh, so knight f6 is impossible. I could go knight e7, I was thinking about this, but I thought after knight e7, uh, White can go queen h5, and now I can't castle, and I'm not hitting on h2. And as this arrow, the arrow is indicating, um, knight takes e6 is now a threat because my queen is kind of, um, my king is kind of messed up here uh, with uh, the queen on this diagonal. So problems, some problems here for sure. Um, and I really was just kind of baffled. I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And so knight e7 looked somewhat compelling to me. But again, I, queen h5 really did bother me. And I said, you know what? I think I have to go for the challenge. I have to take up the challenge. So I played bishop takes h2. And it's amazing because you take the pawn with check. You know, it's, it's very rare that, you know, you could take something with check and it's not a good move. So I was like, okay, let me try to take it and, and be greedy and consolidate. So king h1 was played, and now I have a, a really tough decision about what to do because, again, white is still threatening knight f5 in many positions, but in addition to that, white is also threatening to play g3, which just traps the bishop. And you might say, oh, a g3, whatever, is that really a big deal? Well, let's say I play a move like uh, knight f6. Well, g3 can be played, and then sure, I do get three pawns for the piece, but I don't think my king is going to be secure on the king side, and these bishops are raining, again, my arrows are terrible, but these bishops are just raining down in the position, just totally raining down. This knight still might be coming to f5 at some point, and the queen just needs to, you know, move over to safeguard against, uh, against these uh, perpetual checks, so maybe a move like, I don't know, um... Hmm, what to do? I do have queen h3 as a threat, but if you deal with that threat, you're kind of okay. So, um, I don't know, maybe a move like rook e3 works. Um, I don't know. But the point is is that if I don't have a perpetual check and it doesn't look like I'm going to have it, um, 
the piece does matter. The piece, an extra piece does matter even for three pawns, and I think white would have an advantage here. So I didn't feel comfortable going for that. So I thought for a little bit, and I was like, you know what? Let me just go back. And I went uh, bishop e5. And this was a huge, huge mistake. Um, you can argue that bishop takes h2 is already a little bit questionable, but bishop e5 um, is a terrible, terrible move. Um, and it just allows a tactic I just did not even think about, um, which was knight takes e6. And the amazing thing with knight takes e6 is after bishop takes e6 um, and queen h5, I'm losing a piece no matter what. Um, the issue is that this bishop on e5 is hanging, but if I move it, uh, my bishop on e6 is hanging because of this pin. So if I go back bishop d6, rook takes e6, just picks up the bishop with check. And lo and behold, the material is actually equal, but white has the two bishops, a raging attack, just total disaster for me. So all of a sudden, after uh, after bishop takes e5 and queen h after bishop takes e6 and queen h5, the dynamics just totally work against me because I'm losing one of my bishops. So I kind of recognized here that, you know, this position probably is strategically lost. I know that might sound like strong words, but the fact of the matter is white's going to have the two bishops um, in a very nice, pleasant position. And I pretty much, you know, would just be fighting to try and draw. But I mean, given you know, the circumstances of my lack of development because my queen has moved just a million times, it didn't seem like a position that should be holdable. So I was just trying to figure out what is the best way to get to a position where I could fight. Um, and I reasoned that the best chance I actually had was to go into this end game and make my opponent prove his technical skills. So I decided to give up the e5 bishop and go for knight f6. This forces a queen trade because white needs to recover the piece. So queen takes e5, queen takes e5, and now rook takes e5. And now the dust is settled, the material is equal, but I'm clearly worse because white has the two bishops. And to add insult to injury, white also has a queenside pawn majority. And at the three versus two is a lot easier to mobilize on the queen side than my pawn majority on the king side. Um, because um, because the king is around. So it's hard to mobilize pawn majorities if the king is uh, is near those pawns. So any case, I castled. I thought, okay, I'm connecting my rooks, got to get active. And I was just trying to be as active as possible. White played f3. I think that's a good move. Um, uh, restricting my knight um, from getting to certain squares, um, but also restricting this e6 bishop. Um, so now if I ever got it on this diagonal, it's not really doing anything. So I think it's a great move. And now I went rook a c8, trying to get something going here. If it was my move again, I would think about bishop c4. Because one of the things that could help me tremendously is getting rid of one of the bishops. Um, the bishop pair is really a huge asset because the bishops together control a lot of squares. Again, my arrows need work. But um, one bishop by itself is not as menacing necessarily as the two bishops. Although a bishop is still better than a knight, just important to point that out. So I was already trying to think about trying to trade one of the bishops. White played b3, very good move, just a very alert to that potential exchange of bishop c4. And you can see that white's just trying to stomp out my counterplay and then uh, go from there. I went knight d7, challenging that uh, rook. In hindsight, it might have been better to go rook fd8, but I went knight d7. Rook went back to e1, and then knight c5. Um, and my idea was to challenge this bishop, again, try to trade one of the bishops. Bishop f1, great move. Um, it might look like the bishop's just going back to the retreating square, but really what it's doing is it's making sure the rook still has this file to work with. So putting it on e2 would have been a bad choice. Rook f e8, uh, fair enough, getting my rook, uh, my rook into the game. Note that one idea here, because I moved my knight to c5, was this bishop a3 idea. And so I didn't want to have this skewer. So rook f e8, 
um, bishop e3. And now knight d7. And here I realized that, you know, this knight escapade to c5 was not actually the best. Because if you actually look from c5 for a moment, it actually has no squares. I can't go to a4, can't go to d3, it can't go to e4. So it's actually just a target there, and my rook is kind of tied down to its defense. So I was like, oh boy, this is a bad maneuver. So I just need to go back, admit that mistake. C4 is played, uh, good move, taking advantage of, again, this pawn majority on the queen side. F6, trying to get my knight to a square where it has some activity and is anchored. Uh, note that minor pieces, uh, particularly knights, do need pawns to support them so that they're stable in the center. So that's what I was trying to do. Rook A, D1, knight E5, like stabilizing. King g1, white trying to get the king into the game a little bit. May think think about king f2, getting it closer to the action. King f7, I'm doing the same. King f2, and now h5. And again, my best chance was going to be to try to get some counterplay on the king side going before uh, white's queenside majority really was a problem. So I was trying to get some activity going, trying to take some space, just make it difficult on white to convert. I do believe this position is technically winning for white with the best play. Um, so I'm just trying to make it difficult. So h5, um, bishop d4, Knight c6, moving that bishop away, moving that knight away just to uh, not lose a pawn. Bishop c3. I really like this bishop c3 move because it looks like it's dominating the knight. The knight, again, has no squares, right? If you just fan it out, it just looks, everything is taken. Um, I went rook e d8. Um, I thought trading one pair of rooks would be better for me because my position was so passive. And then bishop d3, um, reasonable move, declining the sacrifice. And now here, bishop d3 actually does allow something, this amazing, amazing resource, which I'd given, you know, a half second thought. But after I looked at it a few moves, I thought, uh, a few moves down the line, I thought, ah, this doesn't work. And the move that would have actually worked is actually an equalized would have been b5, amazingly. The idea is that after c takes b5, a takes b5, bishop takes b5, it looks like white is just a pawn up for nothing, um, but I have this very amazing move, rook takes d7, or rook takes d1, rook takes d1, and knight a7. And the point is that I'm hitting both bishops, and so uh, black has enough play here. And I actually rejected this line, I actually saw this far, believe it or not. But I rejected the line because of bishop c4, and I just stopped here. I was like, oh, um, this doesn't work for me because after bishop takes c4, um, there's rook d7 check, and I'm losing a piece. And if I just calculated one move further, after bishop takes c4, rook d7 check, um, well, First of all, if b takes c4, I can actually, rook d7 check is not a problem I have to deal with right now. I can play rook takes c4. And the point is that this bishop on c3 is hanging. So rook d7 check would just mean we'd trade minor pieces. And this would have been just a fine position for me, just an equalizing position. Um, the other way around would have been a little bit more trickier. So if rook d7 check is played right away, I have to move my king, but even here I'm fine. After rook takes a7, I just play rook bishop takes b3, and this bishop on c3 is hanging, and I equalize. So this was kind of a miss by me. I must say I, I totally missed this detail, and uh, it's too bad because I did see like three moves into the line. I just rejected it here because of the bishop c4 move. And again, it's this idea... It comes like I come. I know it doesn't just happen in my games. We have to go one or two moves deeper. Um, a lot of times, you stop at the end of the line because of a particular move you actually haven't calculated, and it's important to just calculate, just to verify everything. Um, in my case, I did not. So, moving on, I did not go for b5, although that would have been a nice way to do it. 
Um, instead, I went rook d7, trying to just double rooks. And rook takes e6 was played. And rook takes e6, I must say, I was a huge shock to me, just a kind of a jolt to my system because I noticed it right after I played rook d7. When I played rook d7, I was like, Oh my god, oh my god, did I just blunder something? Did I just blunder? Rook takes e6 and bishop f5, and the rook gets to d7, and it's so active. I literally saw this in my mind in, in slow motion. I was like, oh my god, that looks terrible. And then this rook comes to the seventh rank and is dominating me. And uh, yeah, it was just something I was concerned about. So after rook d7, rook takes e6 was played, and I was like, oh boy. I have to go for it. That's the problem now is I have to go for it because I can't go rook takes d3 with this intermediate move because white has rook takes c6. And you can see white is the one that is up a piece at the end of the skirmish. So I had to just take up the gauntlet and I was shaking my head and kind of furious with myself um, that I allowed this. But it turned out after rook takes d7 that it wasn't as bad as it looked. And I looked at the position and I thought, you know what? Um, you know, this rook is, is attacking both pawns. I can't save both of them. Which one is more important? And in my mind, when I answered that question, it was very clear what I should do. Clearly, the B pawn is more important. The reason the B pawn is more important is because white has this queen side majority, and three versus one on the queen side is not something I could tolerate. So, I played b5. I mean, it just it just made a lot of sense to me. And then when I looked at this position after b5, it dawned on me that, hold on, this isn't as clear as it looks because now that the light squared bishop is gone, I actually, or white's light squared bishop, I have a lot of counterplay on the light squares. Uh, note that my pawns here on light squares, this pawn is on light square, my king's on a light square, my, 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 my piece are on light squares, and I can get some counterplay on the light squares if I'm fast enough. White played uh, c takes b5, but it turns out there's not actually something really easy to do because if you go rook takes g7, I just go b takes e4, b takes e4, and I just need to attack the pawn. So um, it's actually not as clear as it looks. If I make a move like knight d8, I'm attacking that pawn. And I'm also stopping uh, rook f7. And if you look at the position after like rook g8, I might even have rook takes c4, and this position looks uh, pretty close to a draw. Um, you might have something like this happen, and uh, yeah, looks looks pretty close. Looks like it's pretty close to a draw because um, it's just white has a better pawn structure, but I don't think um, white can win the h5 pawn without losing the g2 pawn. So it really just kind of became clear that. I actually have quite a bit of counterplay if the position opens up on the light squares. The other thing you could consider is rook d5 check. But after rook d5 check, I have king e6. And uh, after a trade on h5 and takes on c4, I can lock the rook out of the game with g5. And then, again, knight d8 and attack the c4 pawn, which is not easy to defend. And again, I have counterplay here. I'm fighting. I'm fighting. It's not not over. I mean, rook e1 could be played, sure. King f7 and rook e4. But after knight e6, you can see I'm playing on the light squares. My knight is reasonably placed. Um, I might be able to harass this rook. f5 might even be an idea. Who knows? So, not bad. So I realized that, okay, I'm not totally lost, and b5 gives me a lot of activity. White played c takes b5, which I was happy to see because now my rook is unleashed on this unprotected bishop. And after a takes b5, I have some really legitimate threats. Um, I'm thinking about uh, knight e5, uncovering uh, the rook, thinking about b4. All these things look good. Rook takes g7 was played. Again, if rook d5 check, um, I have knight e5. And again, the point is that I'm hitting this bishop, and if bishop takes e5, I can even throw in uh, f takes c5, and then if rook takes b5, rook c2 check. Oop, not c1. Rook c2 check, and I recover the a2 pawn, and this position would be uh, would be drawn. Um, so actually, just to point out really quickly, if king e3, maybe rook takes a2 is not appropriate because f4 is a move here. 
Um, but okay, actually, the G2 pawn is hanging, so I could just take this, and this position is, should be fine for me. Totally fine, yeah. So, yeah, no problems here in these rook end games. So because of that, white tried to play rook takes g7, uh, and now I have these really ugly pawns. I'm down a pawn, and all my pawns are isolated in pawn islands, uh, but I have just enough activity, and it starts with b4. Very important move. The point with b4 is I actually kick the bishop off this square. Uh, note my bishop was di dominating my knight, so now it's, it's going to have to go to a square where my knight can actually move. And this pawn on a2 is now fixed because this pawn on b4 uh, eyes it, so the, the white can basically make use of their majority. So after b4, bishop e1 was played, and now the next step of my plan rook a8. And again, you can see now the benefit of having the b pawn on b4 because now it renders my uh, my opponent's queenside pawns immovable and I take on a8 with check. So huge, huge maneuver. And I thought here, you know what? I'm doing enough. I'm getting enough activity to hold this one. White played g4 check. Um, a move I was happy to see because I get to trade away one of my weak pawns. And after h takes g4, Rook takes g4. I played rook takes h2 check, and now the material's equal. White played king g3, and now I just have to be a little bit precise in taking care of my b4 pawn because um, it looks like it's going to be lost. I can't really defend it again, so I just have to make sure that I'm able to get the b3 pawn in return for the b4 pawn. And I do that by first playing rook e2. I thought this was a really, really precise move. Um, point being that after bishop takes b4, which was played, I play rook e3, and in this version, I take on b3 and it can't be defended. The other way to do it was to try to play rook b2, but I was wary of this position because now white can go rook c4 attacking my knight. I have to move it, and then white plays rook takes b4 and is actually just a pawn up. Now this position is uh, white has uh, uh, black has reasonable drawing chances because black is fairly active. This knight might be able to hop around, but it's just not as clear. And white is up a pawn, so I saw this and I thought rook e2 is way more precise. So after rook e3, uh, the b3 pawn is lost, and now the difference is if you play rook c4, I can actually just go rook takes b3 um, because uh, after rook takes c6. Um, I actually just take the bishop on b4, and the position's totally equal. Um, a version of this actually happened. Um, I did this, this very position right here happened, and then after uh, this position, white played rook c5 check first, which doesn't change the story at all. Um, I just have to be wary not to go to e6, because that would allow white to take with check, and I went to g6. Um, but now you can see this rook is uh, is hanging, and um, well, rook takes c6 was played. I played rook takes b4, rook c5, and here my opponent offered a draw, which I very, very eagerly and happily accepted. What can I say? Um, this was a game I thought I should lose. Um, I thought I'd really, you know, perform some real gymnastics, some real Herculean defending. To, uh, to ensure that um, I didn't go down in this one because this knight takes, uh, this this peace sacrifice on e6 was really just a bolt to the blue to me. It was just such a shock. And to recover from that shock and really just a, a technically lost position to be able to fight back and survive, um, particularly against a good technical player, um, was really a nice feather in my cap. So um, we analyzed afterward, and he thought the, the position uh, wasn't as clearly winning as I did. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I thought, uh, you know, on, on most days he probably would have won this one. And I thought if, you know, if this game was played with, like, two really super strong grandmasters, uh, the, the Carlson-level player wins it nine times out of ten with white. So anyways, happy to escape with a draw get to two and a half out of three, and live to fight another game. All right, um, that's it for this one. Um, thanks for watching. Um, uh, if you like what you saw, please like and or subscribe to the channel. And um, if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster journey, 
please do so by checking out uh, the PayPal description below. Thanks a lot. Take care.